Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 35 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, very good. Okay, we're going to get straight into part one. Everybody who's listened to this show before knows what part one consists of. It's the review, and they also should know that we don't waste time with any long intros. We get straight into it. So we're going to start over in Paris. We had him on our show last week, the former WBO world middleweight champion, Hassan and Dam. He picked up his 33rd career win in what was his 35th pro fight, just like it's our 35th show on this week, as I thought I'd mention. He picked up a TKO in the second round. It was only scheduled for eight rounds. His opponent was a little bit of a journey. Well, not a journeyman. He had a winning record. He had... 16 wins and five losses, but it was always going to be an easy win for Hassan and Dam. So he blew him out and um, I'm pleased for Hassan and Dam. He was a real nice guy on last week's show. If you haven't seen that, you should listen today. It was towards the end of the show, his interview. Uh, That's it for France. We're now going to go over to the Hydro Arena in Glasgow, of course. There wasn't so much boxing on last week, but top of the bill, Ricky Burns against Michele De Rocco. Ricky Burns going into this fight with 39 wins, five losses and one draw. Michele De Rocco, 40 wins, one loss and one draw. Perfect, well, almost perfect record from Michele De Rocco. Um, he had a beautiful record, you know, 40 wins. That's, that's a sensational record. However, looking at his actual wins and the names that he fought, he'd only fought guys that were really fringe so I wouldn't even say fringe world level. I'd probably say like European level. He hadn't really fought past European level and his one loss came at European level. So, you know, I, I think he had, he had one of those padded records. Most of his fights took place in his hometown in Italy. And, um, it really come down to, you know, he, he was really facing the big time here in Ricky Burns' backyard. This was for the vacant WBA World Super Lightweight title, the 140 title. Uh, Ricky Burns, to be honest, he... Look, look, I'll be completely honest. I am I have been pretty critical of Ricky Burns in the past. He's an absolutely lovely guy, by the way. I've met him and he's, he's a real nice guy. But... I don't think he's, a, you know, I think he's over the hill. I don't think he's a brilliant fighter. I don't think he's going to reign with this title. I hope I'm wrong, by the way, but I don't think he's going to reign with this title for a long time. So he got in there. And to be honest, he was, of course, the odds on favorite Ricky Burns. But I had a slight, I mean, I didn't know nothing about Michele De Rocca apart from his record and his huge number of wins, but no one of, of, of a big name at all. And, to be honest, I thought there's a chance that if this De Rocco is is you know is as good as his record suggests, he's going to beat Ricky Burns. But he was absolutely dreadful, and he was exposed by Ricky Burns. So Ricky Burns won every single round. He was absolutely awful, De Rocco, and Ricky Burns ended up picking up the TKO in the eighth round. So to be totally honest, this is a title that Adrian Broner lost on the scales to Ashley Fiafane. Ashley Fiafane got beat that night, and um, Adrian Broner lost the title. So this this title become vacant, and now Ricky Burns has got it. So we may see that fight. Adrian Broner might want to pick up his old belt. I know he's been, he was calling out Ricky Burns a couple of years back now when Ricky Burns was, was champ before and uh, that fight never came to fruition, but we may see it now. And if he fights someone like that, I'm I'm not going to mince my words. If Ricky Burns fights Adrian Broner, he'll get knocked out, you know, but a real nice guy. And I hope I'm wrong. I really hope that he finds some sort of fire. I know that 
he hasn't looked so impressive, but he's had so much going on legal stuff outside of the ring. It, it really comes down to all that stuff can get in a fighter's head. So I really hope I'm wrong. I really hope Ricky Burns can be, you know, can defend his third world title in three weight divisions. You know, that's absolutely sensational. He's the only Scottish boxer to ever do that in history. So I'm real. I'm really made up for him. I as um, I know that the uh, you caught the back end of this fight, so to speak. Um, you had a busy weekend yourself. What do you think of Ricky Burns? Do you think, not not so much in this fight, I'm not going to ask you to analyse the fight, but I'm saying that Ricky Burns, do you think he's going to hold this title for long? Do you reckon he can get a bunch of defences under his belt? Or what do you think of him as a fighter right now? At 140, a weight that he's actually not, you know, he makes. He did say that he made the weight very, very easily. To be honest, he's he's, he's a lightweight. What do you think about that? I I reckon he's a good fight, and I, I, I congratulate him because now he's a free weight world champion, right? Obviously, I reckon he's gonna get a good defenses, and obviously the one defense I can see him fighting is against Ashley Fafe now because Eddie Hearn and Lennon Ellaby might maybe promotions are, are linking up, so that's a fight that could happen in the future. Yeah, that's I tell you what, I as that's very excellently pointed out there. That's that's that very that very much could be a likely possibility. Um, I for one. Oh, that's a that's a really good fight, actually. That is a really good fight. The Ricky Burns of old would have beat Fear Fane. But Fear Fane, the Ricky Burns of... It's all about Ricky Burns. What Ricky Burns shows up, simple as that. We know what, what Ashley Fear Fane brings to the table. He's a good fighter. He's tricky. He can be tricky. Didn't look so tricky against Adrian Broner. But he's a good fighter in his game. He comes to fight every time, Ashley Fear Fane. So, um... That would be a good fight. Do you know what? If I had to edge that one, oh, it's bloody tough. That's a real 50-50 in my opinion. People might think I'm crazy. People might think Ricky Burns takes him out in, in two rounds. But I honestly think that's a close fight. Um, we're going to leave the main event there. We're now going to go down on the undercard. Tyrone Nurse, he was defending his British super lightweight title against Willie Limond. Tyrone Nurse picked up the TKO in the ninth round. So he extends his winning record to 33 wins now, two losses and one draw. Willie Limond, 39 wins, five losses. Uh, I know that Tyrone Nurse and Willie Limond, they really showed a lot of great sportsmanship. They were really, um, um, you know, Willie Limond, gracious in defeat. Tyrone Nurse, um, he, he was basically saying that, you know, he watched Willie Limond when he was coming up and he's got a lot of respect for him. So it's nice to see that between two guys. Um, also on that bill, John Lewis Dickinson, he fought undefeated cruiserweight prospect Tommy McCarthy. John Lewis Dickinson got beat over 10 rounds. This is a unanimous decision. Dickinson was also down in the sixth round. So Tommy McCarthy moves to 9-0. and oh, That's a good win on his record. John Lewis Dickinson, 17 wins, 5 losses. John Ryder was also on the bill, although his fight didn't get televised. He moved to 23 wins. And two losses, he picked up a six-round points win um, against Robert Talarek, who had a record of 13 wins, 11 losses, and two draws. Joe Hamm was also on the bill. He moved to 8-0, and o, even though he was down during the fight. He won on points after six rounds. That's at super bantamweight. Scotty Cardle was also on the bill, and he was cut over his right eye in the fifth round, but he picked up a six-round points win, and he got his 20th career win. He's also got the one draw, but he's still moving on with that, with that undefeated record. Two of those fights with Sean Masha Dodd failed to blemish that, even though a lot of people don't agree with the decision on the night. Anthony Agogo was also on the bill. It's exciting to get him back. Again, his fight wasn't on TV either, but he moved to 9-0 and with a TKO in the third round over Gary Cooper. Gary Cooper had a record of four wins, 19 losses, and one draw going into that fight. So Anthony Agogo now 9-0. and Also on the bill, Charlie Flynn moved to 8-0 and with a points win over four rounds. Connor Ben was also on the Bill, he moved to two and oh. Now, I as you got to see this fight. I know you missed the Connor Ben fight, as you said, but this fight with Connor Ben, it was only over four rounds against a guy called Luke Kelleher. Luke Kelleher, two wins, four losses, and one draw. Connor Ben went in there, and I tell you what, he I mean, it was a fight, it was a proper fight, it wasn't a boxing match, it was literally during some during 95% of it, it was like a pub brawl. I, I, to be honest, I really, I was impressed the way that Conor Ben can tough it out and he can have a fight. He can have a proper tear up 
but I'll be completely honest, it wasn't so impressive either. You know, it wasn't. Um, Kelleher, who's only got two wins to his record, gave him all sorts of problems, you know. He gave him all sorts of problems. He hit him a lot. Conor Ben got hit a lot. I, it just did not look very impressive. A lot of people were saying, it's really funny because there's a proper divide in people's perception of what happened. People are going on Twitter saying, oh my God, he looks absolutely incredible. And other people are going, wow, he's never going to, you know, he's never, he's just going to be a shadow of what his dad ever was. So um, mixed, mixed opinions on that one. But for me, I, it wasn't so impressive, but Nonetheless, he's picked up the win. So, yeah, 2-0 and oh now, Connor Ben. And I'm sure he will progress. It's only his second fight. It's not time to start judging him on, you know, on just two performances. I'm just saying it didn't look so impressive on the night. But I'm certainly not saying he's not going to go on to be, you know, one of the faces in British boxing at all. Also on the bill... Lewis Paulin moved to 6-0 and despite being down in the first round. He picked up a points win over four. Sam Ball moved to 6-0 and with a TKO in the third round, even though he was down in the first round and his opponent was down in the second and the third. A bit of an exciting fight, that one. Even though it only went three rounds, there was three knockdowns. That's it for Saturday night in Scotland. We're now going to go over to Saturday night in Arizona, USA. Uh, we're going to start with a fight on the undercard Shane Mosley Jr he fought a guy called Roberto Young now Roberto Young had a record of five wins seven losses and two draws Shane Mosley Jr six wins and one loss um this again was a bit of a dog fight Shane Mosley Jr was actually boxing but this Roberto Young he was just lunging everywhere he was loading up with massive punches that were just missing it was one of those fights that you couldn't take your eyes off because he was just he was so reckless and wild, he, he didn't really care what he got hit with as long as he tried to land his shots. Some of them landed on Shane Mosley Jr., some of them missed by a landslide. So Shane Mosley Jr. ended up picking up a majority decision win after six rounds. It was a close-ish kind of fight, but nonetheless, you know, he moves on Shane Mosley Jr., Shane Mosley's girlfriend walked him out to the ring. He came in there in business-like fashion and done the business, to be honest. So good win there for Shane Mosley. And it's, those type of fights are good. Those type of fights are good for, you know, good learning fights. The undercard of this actual event was not very good. To be honest, it was it was pretty bad. I don't know. I'm not too sure. if I think it was the first fight event that's ever been on in this particular venue. So I don't know what happened. I don't know what the ticket sounds were like. But it looked pretty, looked pretty packed in there, to be honest. Um, there was a guy on the undercard who actually had the best record out of everyone on the undercard. And his record was 16-0. and 0, And his fight didn't even end up happening. Instead, they got a few other guys on with not-so-nice records. Um, we're now going to go to the main event. He was on our show last week as well. David Avanesian. He was defending his interim WBA World Welterweight title against Sugar Shane Mosley. David Avanesian, 21 wins, 1 loss, 1 draw going into this fight. Shane Mosley, 49 wins, 9 losses and one draw. Could this be Shane Mosley's 50th career win? David Avanesian, I thought he'd done absolutely brilliant. First couple of rounds. I tell you, I actually scored this fight. I don't often score fights, but this one I actually did. I'm going to tell you how I scored it. So I gave the first two rounds to Shane Mosley. I thought Shane Mosley had a good start, but he was always going to have a good start. You know, he's a lot of people talk about his age. Um, you know, he went in there and he's always going to be fresh for those first two early rounds, first three, first four. But I thought he won the first two. And then I gave the next five in a row to David Avanesi. And he seemed to get his distance right. He seemed to be landing a decent amount of hooks. But we know that Shane Mosley's got an absolutely brilliant chin. So David Avanesi, he was, he was five rounds to two for me. And then I thought that Shane Mosley won a round. And I thought it was five rounds to three. Then David Evanesian won the next round. And he won the next round because Shane Mosley had a point taken off. That round was a 10-8 round. That was the 10th round. Um, and then I gave the last two rounds one apiece. So it ended up being Shane Mosley 111, David Evanesian 116. That was the way I had it. A lot of the, the commentary was absolutely dreadful. Kevin Kelly, who's a former opponent of the great Prince Nassim Hamid, he was doing the, the commentary and he had his scorecard. He gave it one round to Shane Mosley, which was absolutely appalling. Everyone else on the commentary team had it a draw. 
I believe I believe there was two guys who scored it, Kevin Kelly and another guy. I'm not sure who it was. He gave it a draw, and and I thought, what the hell? Am I? Is there something wrong with me? Am, am I giving you know? Am I giving a a bad scorecard here? Because mine was quite wide. You know, I had it by five points. So when I found out, when all the judges read out theirs, um, I can't remember. One of them, I think, had it one round to David Avanesian, and the other two had it. I think it was. Oh, I can't. I'm, I can't remember now, but I think it was by six points or something like that. So I actually felt normal again. But um, David Avanesi and he bossed it. And I think this is even though Shane Mosley's old, you know, he's 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 past he's past his best big time. I think this was a good win for David Avanesi, and it's of course a, a really big name on his record. I think this this kind of solidifies his intentions in this division. You know, that that makes him a real threat. This win here, a lot of people won't overlook that name on the record, Shane Mosley. And even though he put up a good performance, David Evanesian was the better man on the night. And he showed us what he's all about. He's tough. He took some punches as well. Really, really tough guy. And I thought he'd done brilliant. I was so, so, so proud of him. And I'm I'm so pleased because he seemed a real nice guy when we had him on the show last week, despite English not being his strongest point. But um, he's now going to fight the winner of Sean Porter and Keith Furman, and that will be for the full WBA world title. So I wish him the best of luck in that one. Okay, that's it for Saturday. We're now going to go over to Sunday. Now, this fight card, of course, took place at Everton Stadium, Goodison Park. We're going to start with the undercard. We cannot jump just straight onto the main event because there's you know i can't just do that it's, i, I want to end part one on a high okay so if you haven't sussed out what's going to happen i've kind of given it away there we're going to start with a win on the undercard from Hosea Burton. He moved to 17 and 0 with a tko in the second round against Joseph Cormani, Joseph Cormani, 17 wins, 24 losses. It was always going to be an easy win for Jose Burton, but he got him out of there in good fashion and early, you know, in that in that second round. It was only scheduled for six. And Jose Burton, I honestly think, very, very underrated fighter. I think he, I really believe in him. I think he's a really, really, really good fighter, Jose Burton. Also on the bill, Paul Smith, he picked up his 37th career win with a points win over Bartolome. Grafka, who had a record of 17 wins, 20 losses, and three draws. So an easy win there for Paul Smith. But I did see him, because his fight wasn't televised, but I did see him ringside when his brothers were fighting on the bill. His two brothers, Stephen and Callum. And his face did look a bit beat up, to be honest. His face did look a bit beat up, but we've seen him look like that in a few fights. So I'm not sure what the fight was like. Like I said, I didn't see a second of it, but Paul Smith got the win. Also on the bill, David Price, the return of the big man. He fought Vaclav Pejar. Now, Vaclav Pejar, nine wins and two losses. Both of those losses were over the distance, so he hadn't been stopped. David Price put him down in the first round and the second round, and he looked pretty impressive, David Price. He landed a beautiful right uppercut. Really, really, really good shot. Um, it just showed a bit of class there. And I know that we, we didn't see too much from David Price. He didn't fight a real contender or anything like that. But it would be nice to see how he looks when he steps up. Uh, you know, of course, he's working with Dave Caldwell, and he's decided to come in heavier than he usually does. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. So David Price picked up his 20th career win. He's got the three losses, all to guys who have tested positive for PEDS. That's, of course, performance enhancing drugs. So very unlucky guy, David Price. I want to see him get back in the picture as soon as possible. Also on the bill, Stephen Smith, he picked up a TKO in the seventh round over Daniel Brizuela. Brizuela was down twice in round seven. This was for the vacant WBC silver super featherweight title. So a good little title and Stephen Smith will be bouncing back in that world picture for the W. I think he's going to now be going down the WBC route. So Stephen Smith, 24 wins, two losses. Now, Kofi Yates fought on the bill. He fought against Tom Farrell. Kofi Yates was 13 and 1 going into this fight. Tom Farrell, 8 and 0. Oh. It was scheduled for 10 rounds up at 140. Kofi Yates, I thought he actually won this fight. It was very, very, very close between between Kofi Yates and Tom Farrell. It, it was definitely one or two. I think maybe you could go two rounds 
to to I think I had it maybe one or two runs to Kofi Yates, but that's not how the referee saw it. It was a points win for Tom Farrell, so he stays unbeaten and moves to nine and oh. But it was definitely a real close fight. Both guys again showed great sportsmanship afterwards in the interview ringside. Sean Masha Dodd was also on the bill. He picked up the vacant WBC international lightweight title against Pasquale De Silvio. This was a unanimous decision win for Sean Dodd over. 10 rounds. So Sean Dodd moves to 11 and 2 with the one draw. Hopefully he'll get that third fight with Scott Cardle. Now the last undercard fight that we're going to mention before we get on to the main event, Callum Smith. He fought Caesar Hernan Reynoso. Callum Smith 19 and 0 going into this fight. It was only scheduled for 8 rounds. Reynoso 14 wins, 7 losses and 3 draws. To be honest, Reynoso was down 3 times. Okay, so once in the first round, once in the second round, and once in the fifth round before it was waved off in the sixth. But Callum Smith, although he won every round, this Reynoso was landing a lot of punches on Callum Smith, even though everybody thought Callum Smith. I actually said that he's going to probably knock him out in the first round or the second round. And I thought I was right when he knocked him down in the first round and the second round, but he didn't knock him out. You know, so I thought it was going to be the end of the fight pretty early. Maybe Callum Smith thought so as well. But this guy gave him kittens during some of this fight. He really did. Callum Smith did not look good at all. Despite winning every round and knocking him down three times within six rounds, he looked, he did not look so good. He really didn't. Now, I know that the guy he was fighting, even though this was at super middleweight, apparently he's had a few fights at light middleweight, so he can make light middleweight. There's a there's a big difference in pounds between those two weights. I don't know if he was just a bit... He, he was very game. He was very game. I don't know if he was a bit fast for Callum Smith's liking. You know, I don't know what it was, but something did not look 100% right with Callum Smith. If he fights someone like James DeGale, who's got that speed and that punch variation, it, it, could, be a, it could be a real... Real tough fight, but but I don't know. I hope that was just, you know, maybe a night off for Callum Smith. He, he didn't look incredible, but again, he still got the knockout. So he moves to 20 and oh, Callum Smith. Now we're going on to the main event. The main event, this was a absolutely action field fight. It only went three rounds. Tony Bellew going into this fight. This was his 30th professional fight. Tony Bellew, 26 wins, two losses and one draw. Ilunga Makubu, 19 and one. His one loss was the first fight of his career. Ever since then, he's been unbeaten, including demolishing Mchunu, who's who a lot of people think is a really, really good cruiserweight. He, of course, got that win over Eddie Chambers as well. So Mchunu got, got beat easily by Makubu. He absolutely beat him up. And, and Makabu, I should call him, sorry. Makabu had 18 knockouts in those 19 wins. So he was a real danger man. Now, Tony Bellew came out in the first round. He was winning the first round pretty comfortably, looked pretty good in there. And then next thing you know, literally about seven, seven or eight seconds, I think, before the end of the first round, he got caught with a counter and he went straight down Bellew. To be honest, I didn't think he was he was, he was was hurt too much. He went down. He's kind of done like a backwards roly-poly and and got back up. He looked to his corner, and, and as soon as the referee had had finished the count, you know, he gave him the count. As soon as the count was finished, Bellew had his hands up, and the bell went. So I don't think he was hurt, but it would have been really interesting if there was another thirty seconds in that first round, you know. So Tony Bellew got through the first round. It wasn't good for him. He lost around ten eight. He went back to his corner, and um, he come out in that second round. It was a good round for Tony Bellew. A few times, Makabu M- landed some good shots as well. It was really action action field this fight. I think it's probably up on it's on it's on Sky. You can watch it on the demand section on Sky. It's probably on YouTube by now as well. But what a fight if you haven't seen it. And then in the third round, Bell you comes out. He's fighting against Makabu. He's 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 kind of throwing a lot at him. And then next thing you know, he lands a few punches. Makabu's on the ropes. It was kind of like the knockdown in the first round. I'm thinking, oh God, don't don't throw because that's the thing with Bell you. Once he finds an opening, he will go for it. He will absolutely throw everything. And he's he's open to being countered. And he just absolutely goes for it. And that's what happened with the first knockdown. I'm thinking, oh God. And then he landed a few punches which look really meaningful. And then he just 
you know, he went from one rope to the other, Makabu, from, from the rope on the right-hand side to the bottom. And the next thing you know, oh, my Lord, he caught him with a big left hook. Eddie Hearn did say that he thought Bellew was going to win the fight by a left hook. And he caught him with his big left hook, and that was it. He was knocked out cold while he was on his feet. And I think Bellew might have hit him with one more punch before he went down, and that was it. It was a big Big, big knockout. So from being down in the first round, he stopped him in the third round. So a wicked, wicked win for Tony Bellew. He was very, very um, vocal on, on what he said afterwards when they interviewed him. You know, the emotions were running so high. You could see it. It was almost, I, I don't, I've watched a lot of fights. I've watched a lot of British world champions pick up a title, uh, you know, against the odds or whatever. And I know that Tony Bellew was an underdog here with the bookies. And it was in his hometown. He'd done this whole thing before in Creed. It was literally the same as, 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 as the film, you know, and it was just amazing. So I was so happy for Tony Bell. You, a lot of the time you see these wins and you, I, I just screamed. I was fist pumping. It's some of these things. They, they, it's almost tear jerking. You know, these, these, these fights sometimes, like the crawler fight, Darren Barker. You know, it's, uh, it's a really what goes into these boxers in the training camp and everything is so much. So to see him do it and his kids were there, it was his first fight that his son had ever seen him, you know, he's ever watched live with him. And he come there, he got in the ring, his wife was there. You could see what it meant to him. And he did say a lot of stuff in the in the post fight interview, but you can't blame him. I think he was he was brilliant and what a fight. He's now saying that he's the best cruiserweight in the world. There's there's a few good names at cruiserweight, so I'd like to see him mix it up. But now he's got of course the vacant well now it's not vacant, it's his, but he's now he's now the WBC World Cruiserweight Champion. So a massive, 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 massive win for Tony Bellew's first professional fight so he moves on to 27 wins two losses and one draw Ayers what do you think about that fight I know you've only seen a little bit of it um what did you also think about some of the talk on the post fight interview I reckon it was a very good fight now we, Britain has 13 world champions and obviously Belly he, what he did was basically the Creed film it was all basically Creed all over again and for that I give Belly huge credit Obviously, from getting knocked down, yeah, and from on the third round from knocking Makubu out, which ever, a lot of people favoured Makubu to win this fight, and barely pulled it out of the bags. Yeah, absolutely. A, lot, a massive, massive credit. Yeah, we've got 13 world champions. We would have had 14 if Carl Frampton didn't vacate his title. Of course, he's chasing, well, he's got that fight with Leo Santa Cruz, so he's moved up a division for that, and he's vacated his title. But we would have had 14. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I think no one nation has ever had 14 world champions at one time. So I think... I think America might have had 13 before, but if we get one more, which we would have had if Carl Frampton didn't take this fight, um, we'd have had the most, you know, Britain would have had the most world champions any other nation has ever had. So that would have been, that have been huge. But nonetheless, it's brilliant for boxing right now. Over here, we are running it right now. We really, really are. But that's it for part one. That's a nice note to end on in part one. We're now going to welcome our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first guest on this week's show. It's Oscar De La Hoya's Golden Boy Promotions undefeated prospect, Hector Tanahara. Hector, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. No worries, no worries. Now, of course, you fought on Wednesday night. Um, you made easy work of your opponent, stopping him inside the first round and grabbing your fourth knockout of six wins. I know it was a short night, but how did it feel in there, Hector? You know, I felt real good. Um, training camp went good. Um, uh, worked on a lot of things, and uh, obviously, uh, I stopped. Well, I hurt him to the body, so we're working on the body a lot, and uh, it showed in the fight, and everything went good. I just wanted to point out, you probably know this anyway. Of course, you've got four knockouts of mm -hmm. six wins, uh, all four in the first round. Every person that you've stopped, do you know that you've stopped them quicker than anyone has stopped them? Do you know that? A little bit. <laughs> Some people you've stopped, they've been stopped in the same round by someone else, but you've got them out of there in less time in the first round. So that's a little that's a little stat I'm telling you about yourself there. You've you've stopped people quicker than they've ever been stopped. So you can hold oh. on to that one. <laughs> right yeah, now, of something, course. Something, something I didn't know. 
<laughs> no, don't forget it now. Don't forget it. Now, of course, you're you're very young. You're only 19. Um, you're a giant, really, for lightweight. But sometimes you come in just a pound above super featherweight, which is which is crazy, really. What weight will you be at when the big fights start rolling in, Hector? How comfortably can uh, you make fe- the weight? Featherweight. Uh, this last fight, I was supposed to be at 130, and I made it. Uh, you know, fairly easy. I didn't have no problems. But uh, my opponent came heavy, so, you know, I had to gain a couple pounds by, you know, drinking something. So I make the weight pretty easy. Uh, featherweight, 130 is uh, where the big fights will be at first, first for me. Yeah, yeah, because, um, yeah, because you're going to be a giant. I mean, in terms of height, in, in terms mm-hmm. of height, you're listed at 5'10". Is that right? Yes, sir, 5'10". Yeah. Okay. Now they they call you El Finito, the Finnish. Where did that name start? I know it might sound a bit silly because you got four first round knockouts, but where did it start from? Um, I was at a national tournament one time when I was younger, and um, one of our boxing friends, uh, coaches from Oklahoma, uh, I you know I was fighting I was in that tournament. I was fighting real real good, you know, out boxing a lot of people, and uh, he just said I look like a uh, El Finito, you know, um, R- Ricardo Lopez, the greatest Mexican fighters of all time. Okay, and it just went, it just stuck from then on. Yeah, it just stuck. I we had, I had never heard that before, or anyone, you know, mentioned my name like that, uh, like close to his. So it stuck, and uh, it's, here we are today. <laughs> now, of course, you fight out of the Robert Garcia gym, the RGBA. A lot of talent mm. in the Oxnard gym. Are you in the Texas gym that they got? Uh, no, I'm in the I'm in the Riverside gym in California. Okay, so the Oxnard one. So, um, how how much of an addition is it to you to be surrounded by all the people? Because that's a real buzzing gym. There's a lot of good fighters in that gym, and of course, Robert, uh, he's he's been there and done it himself. So is Mikey. How does it? How how much of an addition is that when you're training to be surrounded by such such guys, such champions? Oh, you know, man, it's a blessing uh, to be training around champions like that. Mike Garcia, which, you know, I spar a lot. Um, a lot of up-and-coming boxers like uh, Nano Rodriguez. Uh, a lot of my other stable mates that I spar with, Jonathan Navarro. You know, we have Josh Franco. You know, a lot of people that we're just starting. But uh, it's, a, it's a good camp, and um, a lot of people go there. You know, it's a lot of great sparring. Um, also, Robert, I've learned a lot since I've been there. Um him being a world champion, you know, having multiple world champions, uh, his dad, Big G, um, also having world champions. So it's nothing but experience, and uh, and little by little, uh, we're getting better. Yeah, we. I'm I'm a massive fan of the Big G as well. I love the Big G. I like the way he he operates in the gym. You know, he's like the uh, he's like the the secret the secret weapon almost. You know, he's he's excellent. Yep. Now, it's it's interesting you touch on the sparring. You said that you get a lot of good sparring there. I know that you've done some sparring with Lomachenko, which is mm-hmm. which is incredible. How did that go? And what other guys have you sparred that have a big name as well? Oh, you know, that was a big, uh, huge experience for me. Uh, a great opportunity. You know, I got to spar him. And, and um, I did, you know, pretty good. Uh, it was good work. Um, I think uh, his camp was actually a surprise, you know, because they got uh, good work. I guess they... They hadn't really got any uh, before. So, you know, it was good work for both of us. And, um, a good experience for me. And, um, you know, I spar, also sparred the likes of Joseph Diaz, um, Mikey Garcia, um, Ronnie Rios, um, just a few people with the name. When do you think you're fighting next? Have you got any idea when you're next out? I don't have a day yet, but most I think July, sometime in July should be my next date. And how active would you like to be this year? How many fights would you like to have this year? Uh, same as I did, you know, this year, maybe even more. Uh, at least, at least six. You know, um, I want to be, you know, pretty, pretty busy this year and uh, get more experience and more rounds. And now, I just wanted to ask you: Do you watch the sport of boxing? Are you a fan of it as well as a participant in boxing? Oh yes, definitely. You know, a big fan of. I think anyone who boxes is, well, mostly everyone who boxes you know, watches boxing <laughs> just because they're a fan. They want to see, you know, big fights happen and, and just love the sport. And what what fighter would you say is, is your favorite fighter to watch right now? Uh, right now that's happening 
we're not happening yet, but in the future, I think Ward versus Kolev is going to be a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good fight. Who have you got to win that fight? Who are you picking to win that fight? Oh, man, Kovalev is a monster, but uh, I like Andre Ward. Yeah? <laughs> yeah I got I Kovalev on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I got Kovalev yeah, down to the inactivity one. of Ward, man. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a big, that's a big factor in the fight, but uh, it should be a good one. Definitely. And the last question I wanted to ask you, Hector, you, you, you may, you may not really know too much about some of the old fighters, especially uh-huh. over on my side of the water. But anytime I speak to someone from the U S or someone from a different country, I like to ask them who's their favorite UK fighter in history or present. And I, I don't know if you know too much of them. You're only young, of course, but um, is there any particular UK fighter that you'd say is your favorite? There's a few that I know. I think I like Joe Calzaki, you know, he had a good he had a good career. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. We he, had he, um he retired undefeated, no? Yeah, yeah, forty six and oh. Yeah, it probably between Joe Calzaki, I think, and um I think I seen uh fights of Chris Eubank. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Chris Eubank. Yeah, he's got a son who Chris Eubank Junior, who's who's active now. He's uh Yeah, I, I I've seen that. I've seen that too. I've seen that. But I think he, I think I've seen uh old fights of his dad, so I like the way he fought too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you Ni- if you Nigel Ben. Nigel Ben, okay, so you do know a little bit about the history then. <laughs> Couple. There's there's a f you have you ever you've heard of Prince Nassim Hamid, surely? Oh yes. Yes. Definitely. Yeah, very exciting fighter. He was a very exciting fighter. You know, he, he liked to come out, uh, be flashy and stuff. And I, I like the way he fought too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, listen, uh, Hector, I just want to say thank you for giving us a bit of time so close after your fight. I hope that you get out in July. And, um, of course, best of luck for the future. But we'll we'll speak to you again soon anyway. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. We're going to start over in Florida, of course, USA. Uh, Rancis Barthelemy, top of the bill. He faces Mickey Bay. Barthelemy, 24-0, and 0, defending his IBF World Lightweight title. Mickey Bay, 22 wins, one loss and one draw. This will be a good fight. A lot of people recognize Barthelemy as the number one lightweight in the world. He's, of course, a dangerous, dangerous fighter. If he gets the win over Mickey Bay, he he really puts a good name on his record, arguably one of the best names on his record. So, Barthelemy, I think he's going to probably win this fight, but it's going to be a good, good fight. I really, really want to find that somewhere. I don't think it's being aired at all. But also on the undercard, Javonta Davis, 15-0. and 0. He looks to move to 16-0. and 0. His opponent yet to be announced. It's a 10-rounder at lightweight. Dyer Davis also on this bill, former foe of... James D. Gale, I remember going to that fight. Dyer Davis, 23 wins, four losses and one draw. He faces Lisa V. Mayuda, who has a record of eight wins and three losses. Not a, not a high-quality fight, that one. But that's it for Florida. We're now going to go over to Philadelphia, USA. There's only one fight I want to mention on this bill. Heavyweight prospect Cassius Cheney. He looks to pick up his seventh career win. It's only a four-rounder. His opponent yet to be announced. That's it for Philadelphia. Now we're going to go over to Canada. Top of the bill, Artur Baturbiev. Nine wins and nine knockouts. He faces Ezekiel Moderna. Moderna, 23 wins, two losses. Artur Baturbiev defending his WBO international light heavyweight title and his WBA NABA light heavyweight title. Artur Baturbiev, an absolute beast. He's probably going to get another knockout here. Artur Baturbiev. He really, you know, he's he's in that mix. He will be in that mix. I think it's unfair to say he's only had nine fights, but he will be in that picture with Adonis Stevenson, with Kovalev. He'll be in that mix. He's an absolutely, ah, oh, he's, 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 he's devastating. A knockout merchant. He's, of course, got the win over Kovalev in the amateurs, and he's definitely one to keep his eye on. We had Oval McKenzie on the show, and Oval McKenzie said he's the toughest guy he's ever sparred. So, um... Definitely, definitely look out for that. Also, Oscar Rivas is on that bill. He looks to move to 19-0. and 0. He's a heavyweight prospect. It's only an eight-rounder. His opponent yet to be announced. That's it for Canada. We're now going to go over to the Echo Arena. Top of the bill, Paul Butler, 21-1. and 1. That one loss coming to Zelani Tete. He faces 
Pechgenborg, oh god, Pechbarnborg Cockett Jim, who has a record of 38 wins, seven losses, and one draw. This is, of course, for Paul Butler's WBO International Super Flyweight title. Paul Butler looking to get another title shot at Super Flyweight. That's it for the main event. We're now going to go down the undercard. Liam Smith defending his WBO World Super Welterweight title against Pedrag Radcevic. Radcevic, 30 wins, 1 loss. Liam Smith, 22-0 and 0 with the 1 draw. I think this will be an easy win for Liam Smith. Probably a knockout. Zolani Tete also on the bill defending his IBF international bantamweight title against Victor Ruiz. Zolani Tete, 23-3. and three. Victor Ruiz, 21-5. and five. Tom Stalker fighting for the vacant WBO European title at lightweight. He faces Antonio Jao Bento. Thomas Stalker, 10 wins, 1 loss, 3 draws. Bento, 30 wins, 15 losses and 2 draws. This is the third time that Tom Stalker is fighting for the European title. I think it's going to be third time lucky. I think he's going to win this one. Liam Williams also on the card. He looks to pick up his 14th professional victory um that's it for the uk we're now going to go over to the stub hub center carson california one of my favorite venues for boxing francisco vargas top of the bill he faces orlando salido this is going to be a good fight salido's very very experienced this is for vargas's WBC World Super Featherweight title. Vargas 23 and 0 with the one draw. Orlando Salido 43 wins, 13 losses, and three draws. Salido's the only guy to have beaten Lomachenko. Of course, he came in with a huge weight difference that night, and it was it was real roughhouse tactics from him. But nonetheless, he is he's got that win. So um, this is going to be a good fight. But I think Vargas will probably beat Salido here. Gabriel Rosado's also on the bill. He his last fight was in Creed, I think, in the film Creed, along with Tony Bellew. So G- Gabriel Rosado, 22 wins, nine losses. He faces Antonio Gutierrez, 20 wins, one loss and one draw. That's it for Carson California. Now, the last bill that we're going to mention on this week's show, the last bill that we're going to mention on the preview part, top of the bill, we're going to be speaking to him in a moment. Luis Arias. Luis Arias, 14 and 0 with six knockouts. He is fighting Jorge Silva, 21 wins, 10 losses, and two draws. This is a 10 rounder at super middleweight. This is the first boxing event at the Wisconsin Center. So it's good for Luis Arias to get a fight in his hometown and I'm sure he'll win that with flying colours Lewis Arias a real super middleweight to look out for believe me on that okay that's it for the previewing that's all the previewing done on this week's show we're now going to welcome our second guest okay now it's time for our next guest on this week's show ladies and gentlemen please welcome undefeated Rock Nation middleweight prospect Lewis Arias Lewis welcome to the show hey how you doing guys man thank you thanks for having me no problem, no problem. My pleasure. Now, of course, you're fighting Jorge Silva on on Saturday night. What do you know about your opponent, Lewis? Well, I know I know he's a young, tough guy. Um, you know, he's been a lot of rounds. You know, uh, you know, a little experienced guy. He's been some rounds with some good names. You know, and I know he's going to come to fight. You know, he's always he's usually the type of opponent that comes to fight. A good, durable guy. But um, we're ready for it. You know, I, I've had a hard training camp. And I'll put the work in and, and I'm ready for whatever comes Saturday night. Now, of course, this is going to be your your first time fighting in your hometown. How does it feel to bring boxing to your backyard, basically? Man, it feels great. You know, Milwaukee, Wisconsin isn't the biggest boxing city in America. and um, But there's a lot of talent out here. And, and I'm happy to be, you know, headlining a great show down here and to show that I'm bring boxing back to the city, you know, and bring some big events to the city. And this is just, I'm only scratching the surface. It's only the first of many shows that I, I plan on bringing back home. And, and I'm planning on having a great fan base. Now, of course, you're signed to Rock Nation. Obviously, they're a newly formed boxing promotional company. How's that working out for you, Lewis? Um, it's good so far. You know, they're keeping me busy. Um, this is about to be my sixth fight. In you know about a year, year and a half that I signed a contract, you know, so they're keeping me busy. They're giving me the fight, you know, and um, pretty soon, you know, they're uh, they're gonna start making these big stages for me. You know, they're gonna deliver, and I'll be uh, I'll be one of their main, you know, fighters over there. 
You know, other than Andre Ward and Miguel Cotto, they really don't have anybody that, that's ready for that next level. And uh, I plan on being the one. And of course, there's a lot of um, promotional stables in America, you know, so to speak. You've got like Bob Arum, you've got you've got Oscar De La Hoya, Al Heyman's doing his thing. A lot of the fighters that sign for these guys don't actually end up meeting the main man himself. Like there's there's probably a handful of guys, if that, that have actually met people like Al Heyman. Have you have you sat down and met Jay Z at all? No, not yet, not yet. But we're supposed to be having a meeting um, this summer. You know, and um, although, although obviously I would love to meet, you know, Jay-Z and meet those guys, but uh, that's only just extra stuff. My, my my plan, as long as they're keeping me busy, as long as they're giving me fights, and as long as they're delivering for me, you know, it, it's all it's all good. Uh, you know, eventually Jay-Z is going to want to come up and meet me and want to know who I am, you know, and want to know who's doing good things for his company. You know, so it's only a matter of time, you know, um, and and all those things that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I thought I'd touch on, um, of, of course, you were previously part of Mayweather Promotions. Um, Floyd Floyd dropped you from that. Um, you tried to confront him man to man, of course, someone caught a bit of footage on video. What actually happened? Because a lot of people, especially this side of the water, don't really know what happened there. Yeah, well, um, things are going good. You know, I mean, I felt like I was the best fighter Floyd had, you know, and... Um, you know, people people weren't doing as good, and I was consistently doing my thing. But, you know, for whatever reason, you know, he just decided that we should have separate, you know, and he decided to, to let me go. But the way he the way he did it was, was, was just unprofessional to me. So that's why I confronted him, and I was asking him, you know, like I just wanted it to come from his mouth. Now, I, the, I didn't care about, you know, not being part of the, the money team or none of that because I was undefeated. I'm 10 and 0, you know what I mean? Even when all that happened, everybody wanted to sign me. So... That wasn't the problem. It was just the way that he did it, you know. So that's all it was, was, you know, the, the the video that got out was just me trying to confront him and just trying to, you know, get some type of an answer, get some type of an explanation, you know. And But, you know, I never got that, you know. But it is what it is. I'm still doing my thing. It, it ain't stopping anything, you know. And it's only a matter of time to to till I'm the face of boxing, you know, and that I'm one of the big guys in, in the sport. And what is your relationship like with Floyd now? I don't even speak to him. Don't I, have, I haven't even spoke to him since since that video it was the last time I talked to him. And you know, I could care less. You know, like I said, I, I'm I'm moving on my, with my career. I'm moving on with my life, and uh, it was fun while it lasted. But I'm on to bigger and better things. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you this. Um, of course, Floyd goes around saying he's TBE. In your opinion, Lewis, is he TBE? I think. I think he is the best defensive fighter ever. I, I honestly don't want to – I can't label him the best ever because, um, you know, there, there's just there's so many greats and so many so many great fighters, you know, and um, I felt like he could have did more to, to, to you know, to, to help out with the sport and, and done more, you know, to, to, <clears throat> to become a great, you know, but his impact in the game hasn't been the best, you know, and on top of that, like, He's he's always played it safe with his opponents, you know. What I mean, he always made sure that he didn't take that much risk in any of his fights, you know. And and it kind of messed up the games. You know, now now the game is all about it's all about money now. You know, guys don't want to take risks. You know, guys want to um not you know not say not duck fighters, but just dodge fighters and just let fights prolong, you know. And I felt like he could have did. You know, he had such great talent, but it, it, he never really got to show the best you know, when he was fighting the best, you know, and had fights at the riskiest times, you know, he, he, like I said, like his opponents, you know, like, as they should have been, were, were handpicked, but he picked everyone with a low risk. You know, he, he never fought guys at their peak, you know, and, and that's going to taint them a little bit. But again, can't take anything away from him. The four down guys he put in front of him, he beat, um, he made the most money ever, you know, so of course he's amongst the great in that end, but to be the best ever, the greatest ever, the greatest ever, and I, I I wouldn't give it to him. Who would you give it to, Liz? <laughs> I would say I can't give it to just one guy, but some guys that I would label the best would like Muhammad Ali, you know, Tyson and 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 Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. You know those type of fighters. You know, even Sugar Ray Leonard. Those guys you didn't fear anybody. They didn't care to protect that. Oh, you know, they fought whoever they needed to fight at the time they needed to fight for 
for whatever, you know, it was, it was no fighting around. It wasn't any ducking and dodging. It was just straight business. And the impact that they did outside of the sport, you know, and uh, the, the way they were able to connect to people and become, you know, the people's champion and be loved by everyone and not play the villain, you know, um, I would give it to one of them. Yeah, I don't think anyone could argue with that. Um, of course, you complain at middleweight. Middleweight is currently Mm -hmm. one of the most exciting weight divisions in boxing. What's your opinion on Canelo dropping his WBC belt, Lewis? I think that was, that was, um, I thought that was pretty soft, you know, um, like I, you know, like I'm saying that now the sport is all about, you know, dodging fights, you know, letting fights prolong so you can get more money and, and, you know, the business aspect and well, I'm the face of this and, and you have to, kneel down to what I say, you know, I, I thought, I thought that was pretty foolish, you know, um, guys, you know, wait their whole life to get that belt and you just give it away just cause you don't want to fight this guy because they tell you, you have to fight this guy, you know, back in the day was when you have to fight this guy, you fight him and that's it, you know, win, lose or draw. But now they they want to put every, everyone's being so protected, you know, it's all about protecting the fighter and protecting the record and protecting their, their, their reputation and all that, you know? So, I mean, I felt I felt the fight could have been made, you know, but you know it's, it's the business part of the game. Now, of course, you've been around that Mayweather sort of gym. You've been in a few other gyms, I'm sure. Um, what sort of names have you sparred with? Some names that we may know. Well, um, I was in training camp with Arizlani Lara before. Uh, I was in camp with Chad Dawson when he was the light heavyweight champ of the world. Um, obviously I sparred Floyd Mayweather and got him ready for Cotto. I mean, those are pretty much the bigger names that, that I've dealt with. You know, when Ishe Smith had the belt, I mean, obviously he's not as big, but when he was champ, I was, I was, around, I was sparring him too. So it was, it was a couple, I got a couple good name guys on my belt that I, that I've been a camp with. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Lewis, just for those people that may not know, um, that may not know the backstory, I maybe should have asked this as one of the first questions, but for those people, perhaps from this side of the world, that may not know the backstory, of course, you're Cuban-American. Could you sort of tell us, just sum up sort of in a couple of sentences, you know, how the whole thing began, how you, you know, from from being a youngster up to this point, what, what we're at right now? So uh, my my father is Cuban, my mom is Nicaraguan. They were both born over there, and they came to America. I was born here in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in the United States. I turned, I started boxing when I was about seven or eight years old. Um, I ended up falling in love with it, stuck with it. I ended up becoming a seven-time national champion. I was on the U.S. team, everything. I was one fight away from going to the Olympics. I went, moved to Vegas, and that's where I turned pro, turned professional. Got an opportunity to basically spar Floyd. Floyd, I sparred with him. He liked it, and he ended up picking me up. I had my first ten fights with Floyd, and now I'm with Rock Nation, and I'm 14 and 0, about to be 15 and 0 come Saturday night. I like it. I like it. <laughs> okay, listen, Lewis. Last question I got for you now. This is one I have to ask to anyone from overseas. Um, a lot of people like to know the answer to this. Who would you say in history? is the best, in your opinion, UK fighter? I ask this to all the guys. I'll tell you oh, some Lennox, of the... Uh... Lennox, Lewis, Lennox Lewis, without a doubt. I mean, yeah. Lennox Lewis is ar- arguably the best heavyweight ever. You know I mean? So, uh, without a doubt, Lennox Lewis. You know, I would definitely put Lennox Lewis up, up there with Amongst the Great. Then I would, uh, I would throw probably... I would go Prince Nassim Hamed and then Ricky Hatton. I would say that, or even Nigel Ben. Yeah, I mean, you guys have a lot, but definitely Lennox Lewis. Joe Calzaghe in there with a shout? Joe Calzaghe. Oh, yeah, Joe Calzaghe. Forgot about Joe. Definitely <laughs> Joe. Too. Dang. You guys have a lot of great champs. A lot of we great do. champs. Boxing's, at, at the minute, we've got 13 world champs, you know, right now. Right now, at this minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's really yeah. booming. But listen, Lewis, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. I appreciate you giving us some time this week. We wish you the absolute best of luck for Saturday night, and no doubt we'll speak again soon, my friend. I appreciate it, man. To all the UK fans, man, thank you. I appreciate you guys. You know, uh, the UK is just a, a great, such a great country for boxing, man. And hopefully one day I can come out there and, and, and fight. We'll, if fight you do come. Soccer stadiums. 
Yeah, yeah. If you do come, we will welcome you with open arms. Lewis, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, too. Okay, now it's time to conclude episode 35 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. Once again, a massive thank you to our two guests that took part on this week's show, both undefeated, the guests on this week's show. A massive thank you, firstly, to Lewis Arias, 16-0 and at the moment, soon to be 17-0 and on Saturday. And a massive, massive thank you to the undefeated 6-0 and prospect at the moment, Hector Tanahara. So thank you very much. And that that Spanish pronunciation hopefully goes down well with all the listeners. Once again, thank you for listening this far on this week's show. Please keep retweeting, favoriting, liking, sharing and all the rest. And we'll be back next week, as always, with another big show. Until then, my friends, take care.